to the On Road Podcast. Welcome to this week's On Road Podcast, episode two. On today's show, we've got a great interview with Mr. Mar Dave himself, Chris Wilkinson. A new segment to the show is Spash It's Speed Secrets. David Spash It tells us how we can find some vital tents on the track and discussing caster. And the big interview of the show is Ollie Jeffries, the Schumacher driver, who turns his hand to 12 scale from his normal TC racing. He has some uh, insightful views on how he goes about his business. So let's crack on. The news section. First up in the news is ETS. That was on uh, last weekend, Ant. Um, talk us through the results. Yep, so uh, ETS in Germany, uh, Dawn or Down in the lovely uh, wood wood panelled sports hall that looks like a bit like a massive sauna. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 Did, that, the, did the guys send the rostrum with a towel on? Oh, I don't know. I missed the rostrum shot. I'm hoping not. That's not something <laughs> I want to see. So uh, after practice, um, the standing order was Bruno followed by Ronald and then Mark Reinhardt. Uh, separated by a tenth of a second over three laps. Um, Mark Reinhardt, with his automatics again, took Q1. And then um, Ronald, with his new production version of the Yokomo BD10, took uh, Q2, 3 and 4. So for the finals grid, it lined up Ronald, then Mark, and then Yannick Prumper in third with his automatics. Um, the the racing was was thick and fast. Um, final one: Volker, Mark Reinhardt, and then Bruno. F2: Bruno and Yannick um, decided to make a mess out of fighting over third place. Um, so we had Volker, Mark, and then Christopher Krapp, who took uh, took advantage of Bruno and Yannick crashing into each other. And then in final three, it was uh, Reinhard followed by Prumper and then Bruno. Now, interestingly, Volker set it out after w- securing the overall. And I, I always thought that sitting out the, the third round was, you know, something you did just to be flash and save your tyres or, or whatever. But I found out today that it's actually a rule at ETS that if you win the first two finals, then you have to sit out the third one. So... A little bit of interesting thing there that, that I never know about. That is quite interesting because I want to run my little toy car. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've paid all that money, gone all that way. Yeah. I I've charged me back, Chris. I've done my tyres. Do you know what I mean? Someone said, sorry, mate, you can't run your car. Yeah. yeah. Sure, I'm, I'm not sure I'm buzzing over it. I might write in. Yeah. Dear, uh, <laughs> dear Mr. Ryan. So, yeah, so I mean that 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 ETS uh, event looks really well established, doesn't it? And clearly, all the the big names go and run. How long has that has the ETS been going for? Oh, you've put me on the spot. Several years <laughs> is my uh, non nondescript <laughs> answer. So it's like run it. by um, it's it's run by Mark Reinhardt's dad. Um, is it? Uve, I think his name is. And they run um, ETS, which is a touring series, uh, EOS, which is the off-road series, ENS, which is the nitro series. Um, I think that's it. And it's um, Scotty Ernst does the the commentating. I don't know how he's involved in any other way or, or if he's just a commentator, race director, uh, you know. Do we know how many drivers are there? It was four. I know that much. I can. I can no. probably tell you. Ah, oh, no, I can't. There were. Um, there were forty-nine in mod. Right. Um, which, which is, you know, a lot. And I think in stock there was forty-seven. <laughs> so, yeah, got one, two, three, four, five, six classes, probably mm. with fifty people in each. Oh right, okay, crikey. So that's yeah, that's an all-day affair as well, isn't it? So that's that's going to be going into the night sort of thing. So uh, the only reason why I ask that is because you know making these 
events uh, as big as they are, you know, with Scotty Ernst, and I'm pretty sure he has a fee. Uh, dare I say he charges to, to come along and and be involved. So it, just uh, just the logistics of it and financially how it all all works out. But no, it's um, it, it's interesting. It, it, yeah, these big events don't happen overnight, do they? A bit like you know we're going to talk about snowbirds in a minute. And another one that sort of has over time built a bit of a reputation as ets has yeah well i think so these big events like ews as a as a example of something that kind of isn't the same thing but it's a series that put on a big race so ews is big in the uk and then they put on the international once a year um where you do get all the all the big names come over, at least the, the ETS big names like Reinhard Volker, etc. cetera, um, Hagberg. So they, they could possibly build out, but the thing is with ETS covering Europe, that's pretty much done. And then you've got the um, Asia version as well that I think is Scotty's, um, Scotty's deal entirely. So you've got the Asia on road, the Asia Nitro um, and I don't know if they do an off-road version of that as well but that's the same sort of deal same sort of formula big big races um, a series so that people you know sign up and they attend more than one um, yeah definitely not happening overnight and that they look you know they're they're on the on a par with things like the world's in terms of size yeah. and an organization um, I don't know how much they cost to enter, whether it's a similar sort of scale. I I don't think so. Um, but you've got to think the, the amount of effort and money that goes into it, they're, they're not doing it for fun. They're, there's definitely money being made. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this, that's just one of the venues that they ran at last weekend, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, they do. I think it's six rounds and it goes all over mainland Europe. Yeah, amazing. I mean, because uh, that's really cool. That the fact that it's a sort of a T-shaped uh, room. You would, you would have thought instinctively walking into that room for the first time, they would have gone, nah, this this, yeah. this isn't going to work. <laughs> because, but of course, if the rostrum, I suppose, technically is in, is sitting in the gut of that the T-bar, it it does work. So. Um, it, it, the unique nature of that hall actually makes it something that's uh, quite enjoyable to watch and different to to everything else we see. Yeah, exactly. And they run the buggies in the same same room the week yeah. before. Um, and nice. again, you know, they they make use of that space. It makes it a lot more interesting than than the normal tracks, really. Yeah. So moving on to snowbirds. Uh, this this has great coverage. Uh, I think you know it's a it's a week long event in Florida. Uh, a good friend of ours, Grant Williams, went out, and obviously Ollie Payne and a few of the others, Lewis Barker, went out. Um, they all sound like they had a had a great time. And it's and it, the, the, it's a week long. People are staying in a hotel. For those that don't know about it, staying in the hotel where the tracks on the um, where the tracks hosted rather, and you get live feed for all of the races um in your hotel room which is really quite cool and and there's various pictures that go around on facebook of people pitting in their in their room i have to say that doesn't that doesn't really appeal to me i mean i think we've all experienced the tire truing in your room <laughs> at the premier inn uh <laughs> doing your car in the premier inn it doesn't it doesn't necessarily appeal to me um, and I think there's a fee for actually pitting trackside, um, at, you know, for those that want to do it. But that being said, it does seem a week worth of racing that is extremely enjoyable. I know I've spoken to G and he, he, he really enjoyed it. He went there for the first time. What, what are your thoughts on, on Snowbirds? Do you like the, the, the appeal of it? Um, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you, I, I get tired, as you know, and I, I think that I'd be a little bit tired and emotional by the end of that. Um, I was looking at the practice stats earlier for, for the Saturday. Um, 
the track opened at half two in the morning, I think, and there were 3,200 laps done in practice by 115 drivers. Um, I, is this the one where, where the track is open basically the whole time and it switches between oval and on road? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just crazy times, right? Like 6 a.m. races. <laughs> Yeah, G, G texts me saying, because obviously they're five hours behind, he texts me, just got up at 5.30, sticking some additive on and about to go out and do mod. Yeah, <laughs> that's I mean, yeah, not my <laughs> cup of tea. I enjoy, I enjoy having a bit, bit of a lay in, but I mean, it's in Florida. I think the kind of it all being in that one space, you, you could possibly not see daylight for for the entire time you're there just focusing on your on your racing but yeah 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 and, and of course yeah you go to vegas on holiday and that it's the same deal isn't it so technically you are on holiday doing what you do in the same way people go to vegas and go and see shows and stay in a casino for, yeah. for three or four days so you know if it's your if it's your passion and a bit of fun um it is what it is. It, unfortunately, it's you're getting on a plane, flying seven hours, sitting in a hall that could be in anywhere in the world. Yeah. But unfortunately, outside it's really nice and sunny, uh, and lots of nice things to do as well. So it's, it's it is a funny it is a funny uh, proposition to go all that way and race a toy car and not see the outdoors for for five days. Yeah. If you're going to race outdoors at um, wherever that track is in Kissimmee, the, yeah. the cool outdoor uh, one, that's a whole different kettle of fish, I think. Or or going to race something unique. I mean, I guess it's it is unique because it's in a hotel and it's on that ridiculously grippy carpet. And but yeah, it's it's not yeah. not high on my list of things to do right now. Yeah, so so just looking down. Um, the results for uh, Snowbirds. I mean, let, let's start off with um, Touring Car. Um, Hugo TQ, didn't he, with his Serpent? He did. That was, was that was that a shock, potentially? Not to oh. me. I mean, Hugo's been, been on an absolute tear uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I think at... Um, the 110 series over in Asia, he's been just ripping that up. Um, I think that he TQ'd every round in qualifying for round five and six, um, won every final. It's just like, um, yeah, he's he's just a machine. And that um, that serpent, they've they, it's the new one that they're running, the X20, I think it is. Um, so before Serpent had, oh, we talked about the Serpent 12 scale before, their, um, their touring car platform was a little bit odd. Uh, they tried to do some things that were innovative and a bit like the automatics. I think they were going for ultra low uh, center of gravity and, and, and that. And I don't think it really worked that well um, compared to you know, X-Ray, Automatics, Yokomo. And then they've, they've brought out this new car, which is sort of similar to, to their old concepts, but they've gone back to shocks, proper shocks and springs. And um, and it's been amazing in, in Asia. Hugo's been all over with it and, and really doing well. But it looked to me like it was a low traction car. It was, it was super good in one of the races in China they, they didn't use additive and um, it was outdoors on tarmac with no additive so not not the highest grip situation you're going to be in and um, it just did exceptionally well so seeing it go to to America and run on CRC carpet there was perhaps a, a doubt that he'd be able to get it working but obviously uh, he did, and he's he's no slouch. So, yeah, he TQ'd, and then in the final, um, Alex managed to uh, 
to get to the front and stay there. Uh, mm. You go second and then Sam Isaacs third. So Alex, obviously, with the X-ray that that he's well known for. Um, and Sam, Sam Isaacs running the uh, automatics. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I watched I watched a lot of the uh, the snowbirds because the coverage is pretty good. I mean, they just got a, a camera on there full time, and, and and watching it, I I thought that thought the track was quite open and didn't necessarily float my boat. If I was being brutally honest, um, a bit of a difficult one, isn't it? I think trying to accommodate a touring car and twelfth twelfth scale, I think that's a, a difficult. Uh, especially at a big, big track as, or a big event as well. But they obviously did a, did a really good job. Alex, uh, with his T4, do you think that he's doing better with this car than the previous car? Hmm. There's, there, there's a question. I've just pulled out the bag. Yeah. You didn't out. So I thought I'd just start it that way because <laughs> I'm interested. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that what Alex runs is what Alex runs yeah. and isn't necessarily what you're going to buy. Um, so as, as is with, with so many of these cars though, right? Of course. I mean, I don't, I don't think that's specific to Alex. Uh, no. I think that's specific to everyone, whether yeah. it's well scale, TC, whatever. hundred percent. So I think that, um, there are. Are a bunch of things that that get released uh, with every new kit, and you know X-ray obviously are on a yearly cycle, as we've uh, you know famously had people moaning about all the time. But um, in each iteration, there are things done that would would or could be useful in certain situations. So the current X-ray has got super short shocks. Um, low towers, um, which probably was a was a benefit in on CRC carpet, uh, high grip situation, probably next to useless on a UK dusty outdoor track. So, yeah, he, he probably had the right tools for for that situation. But I think that Alex probably more than anyone else, Alex probably has the right tools for every situation. Um, because of how he approaches things and how he's, you know, so close to the factory and knows what what he needs for each race. Mm. And and why why is it do you think that let's say a Snowbirds, the, why doesn't that attract uh, a, a Volko, a Mark Reinhard? What what what's what would be not attractive to them to go across and and race? Yet yet Alex does. Is there a difference in budgets, do you think, between a Mark Reinhard uh, a potentially? Yeah, so take Mark out of it because he's not factory sponsored. Oh, well, he, he might be now. But um, so talking about Volker, Yokomo really aren't very big in North America. Um, I don't think that they're particularly interested in being big in North America. Um, and so there's no, there's no reason to spend the money to send him over there. They're, they're not going to, they're not going to build a brand based off of him doing well over there. Um, I don't know what Serpent's deal is, whether Hugo's, you know, fu- self-funding some of it or if they're paying travel or what, but um Serpent's a bit of a funny one where I think that touring car isn't their main thing and they're probably pretty big um, in off-road in America um, more than more than on-road and they might see the crossover as a, as a useful thing. Um, but yeah, X-Ray, huge in America, huge worldwide. And I think that, um, you know, you've got Robbie Dodge and some other chaps over in the US who are who are there as, as the team and I think that Alex going just bolsters their their already strong selling points. Mm. Yeah, it it because I if following on social media with because I use X ray stuff and you know 
following Robbie Dodge and Max Keening and and obviously Alex, yeah, there's a, a, a nucleus that seemed to go around the US and run, uh, you know, touring car and 12 scale, but obviously they don't make the transition over into, into Europe. There's a separate team and I suppose because of the, the size of their company and the, the reach that they have, that makes it way easier financially to get you know, good drivers in the US or in Europe to, to run those relevant events. Whereas you know you, you've got other companies that don't have have that 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 spread, I guess, and I suppose that's I've already answered my own question there. I suppose yeah. why why many of them won't won't make these travels because you know uh, you go from Japan, right? Yes. You know, I, I saw him at, at, uh, at the NYGP when I went there, not last year, uh, not this year, but the year before. Sorry, not 20, 2019, 2018. When I yep. went, um, he was there. I'm not sure whether he went last year or not. Actually, to be fair, but very impressive driver. But they, you know, these guys that are, you know from Japan to China, uh, Japan to America to Europe. That's a, that's a, a decent trip, and you know, there's a you know a flight accommodation. You know, we've all done travel around the world. It's expensive stuff, and to see the the payback of that, I just don't know. <laughs> how it can work um it's a, it's a it's a it must be so difficult for these companies to really get behind a driver and push him around the world when they're trying to recoup funds on such a niche market yeah yeah i mean Hugo was at uh, ats right at the weekend as well came 10th so yeah he's he's all around the world but then you know it's it's hard to know what people's are arrangements are um you know friends of ours traveling around self-funded or you yeah. know we, we're, ne we're never really going to know who who is getting what or who's who's having to pay for for whatever but the the yokomo thing's interesting because i think that Yo yokomo in europe isn't really the factory i think that's mebo sport is um is doing all of that so the guys right. that are being sponsored are, are in the main not being sponsored out of, out of Japan. Um, yeah, and I think that there's obviously changes going on at Yokomo at the moment, and I don't know. They seem a lot to be very interested in uh, drifting, and yeah. Uh, yeah, not so much in anything else. But then you know, with off road, the, there's a decent Yokomo following in the US, but that's only off the back of having you know, one really amazing driver and trying to build a team around him. So mm. Brian Mayfield and then, you know, so you, you do need to get someone on board, but then you're going to have to be paying them a, a fair amount of money. And yeah. I have a, a, a reasonable idea of how much that is. So um, 12th mod was at Snowbirds as well. Um, Alex did the business as usual. He's, he's, he's pretty successful at Snowbirds, isn't he, Alex? Uh, he TQ'd, and in the final, uh, Alex, uh, Knapp, and Payne were the top three. H how do you? How did you see that play? Oli had a, another poor start, first lap. Um, I think he got knocked down to last, I think, and then battled his way back. But obviously. Unfortunately, that by that time, you know, the you sort of sown your seed sort of thing, haven't you? So it's it's very difficult to to catch up that far in in any top class field. But Alex's performance, how did you see that? Not much competition. That's, I know it's a bit a bit uh, disrespectful to Andrew Knapp and Ollie Payne, but Alex seemed quite comfortable the whole time he was there. Yeah. Although I think on, uh, I don't know what the lap times were like, but I don't think he was uh, you know, miles ahead, was he? I mean, I've got it in front of me. Hold on. Yeah. I know in touring car, he was only like a tenth quicker. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like four hundredths quicker on his fastest lap than yeah. Andrew Knapp and Ollie Payne was faster. Um, interesting uh, that Kevin Herbert 
had the fastest lap out of everyone in the final. Um, yeah, yeah, because it because it's 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 been quite interesting with uh, you know from my experience with with the X ray what what's yeah you know, what was used at the Worlds what was used at Snowbirds you know there's a bit of a prototype front end that Alex is trying uh, couldn't get it to work at the Worlds but used it at Snowbirds and so. Yeah, we were just only talking about a little while ago about using different parts on these cars. Um, but it works very nicely in, at, at Snowbirds, but couldn't get it to work at, at, at the Worlds. And I think, again, you, you, you look at these guys and these drivers and, that you know, whilst we have some practice and all this, these bits that you're trying to find right for the certain track, it still doesn't give you the big, biggest amount of time to find the right place with your car in 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 these race events it, that, that's what it feels like to me it feels like you it almost feels like by the end of sunday ah, finally got the car in the right <laughs> yeah place. yeah you've been there since bloody friday and you've been out on the track so many times of course the track's evolving well the track's evolving tire prep etc 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 and it, and then i just think it's the, the amount of experience that has to go along with doing well. You look at Alex and with the amount of racing that he does with touring car and with 12 scale, that has to have a huge advantage over someone like, you know, you go, as I know Sam Isaacs does at 12 scale as well, but Ollie's principally 12 scale, Andrew Knapp's principally 12 scale, isn't he? Uh, does a little bit of touring car maybe in the US. But Alex is um, bouncing between TC and 12 scale. I think that has to have an advantage. Uh, yeah. You I don't just, know. You, I sense that you disagree with that. Well, it's not that I disagree. It's just I don't know. I think that you've got drivers that are good at RC, full stop. And I think that... Yeah, I'm not sure how much of it translates between the classes, to be honest. I mean, you've got someone like Bruno, who I think can really drive a car. And I think that his mechanics is largely done by other people for him. So he doesn't need to have the, the knowledge to transfer between classes other than, you know, the, the four wheel drive buggy feels like a touring car with jumps. And, you know, he doesn't really like two wheel drive as much because it feels different. Um, but he did all the nitro and all of that and, and did well. But I think it's kind of like put a car in front of him and he can watch it round and, and make it go. Um, Ollie Payne, I mean, he went and drove a touring car that wasn't his at mm. Snowbirds and did pretty well. I think he came six over, uh, in the end in touring mod. Yeah. Uh, I think he qualified fourth. So, um you know, we say that Ollie's a 12 specialist, but you know, clearly he can he can will most Absol things. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, not, definitely not, definitely not um, suggesting that he, he can't will both. I just think that when you're talking the difference between first and third and first and fifth, I think that's quite at at the sharp point, you know, sharp end of any sport. I think that's a big gulf. There's a big difference there. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with point ones and point twos, that's not a lot, is it? And I just think that I don't know. I, I, the, maybe this separating factor is that Alex drives so much, so many places around the world, and has done so for such a long time. I think that that has to play a huge role in in his success. Yeah, but. So, I mean, I I like Alex and I, I, the fact that he's the one we're talking about is, is kind of irrelevant. He came fifth at, at ETS. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're, we're saying that uh, and the people he's, he's driving against, like Volker, um, Christo Christopher Kratt, they're TC specialists. And then you've got Reinhard, who's obviously... A little bit good at um, 12th as well. 
um, and Bruno ahead of him. So I, I don't know. It doesn't it doesn't feel to me like there's a whole lot of evidence to support that doing two classes is is better for you know elite performance. Interesting. Well, we'll we'll move on because um, we pretty much covered the the bigger past few weeks. Um, X ray T four bumper stopper. Um, that's a a part that's needed or a, a hop up on the on the X ray T four. That's been a bit of an issue. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I, I want to be careful because I don't want to call X ray out as um, as doing something wrong, but if you crash and you drive an X-Ray T4, the, the 2020 car, I would definitely buy a bumper stopper for your car. X-Ray make one, RC Maker make one. I think that uh, Rand Racing Products do one as well. The car um, is probably faster without it. Um, there's a little bit more front flex, so it'll have more steering, uh, but it does make it a little bit fragile. And I've, I've seen firsthand a, a couple of reasonable size crashes but they've written off a chassis so um just worth spending a few quid and, and buying one of those so x-ray do it uh rc maker provide one as well so a couple of resources there that you can get that bumper stopper um now we we had we had a little chat earlier um about uh getting close to apexes and not crashing. Now, we, we've been, <laughs> we're always talking, Ant and I talk probably all day, every day, um, in and around our work life about car racing. And, and um, just recently at the, uh, at the national that we'll talk about in a little while at uh, Chesterfield, I had a go with running a, uh, a Schumacher Eclipse on the Sunday. Uh, I'm an X-ray driver. I run the X12. When I say I'm an X-ray driver, I love the product. I run the brand. Uh, I support it. I get some help from RC Disco, which I'm very grateful for. But whilst it's my hobby and I want to um, do the very best I can, I want to try the competition because I think that's what I want to do. I want to see what they're they're doing. And obviously, we all know that the Eclipse has been uh, a, a very successful uh, platform already um the eclipse 3 um most notably and so i went out and on the sunday andy murray and the, and the guys at schumacher helped me out set it up and and i had a good day trying it and in the final um it was it was really very good and so and saw the, the clip of my final and i said what did you think he said you crash a lot stuart well, I said, you know, I felt like I could drive really close to the apexes and, and, and make a, a really quick time. And I did. My hot lap was only 0.1 off of Dave Spash. Or my best has been 0.3. So there was clearly something in the car that weekend that I, that I did really well. But Anne has got this belief that you don't need to drive close to apexes to be quick. So... <laughs> <laughs> over to you Anthony <laughs> yeah that's that's not quite what I said ah, so right, so okay so let's so what we're saying is there's a goalpost moving here no what we're saying is you've you've failed to listen so you said to me when we left the world that you think that the next the next step in your getting faster um is to drive closer to apexes pretty much paraphrasing and Correct. and I thought to myself, that's not right. So so my my theory on this, and I'm I'm happy to be wrong because as Gav Clinch pointed out at a national when I was chatting to Matt Baker about how I was driving around the track, he did say it's like the blind leading the blind. So I'm I'm you know well aware of my uh, my skill or lack of it, but for every corner for every driver and every corner and every race there is an an optimum closeness to a to an apex uh an optimum way to drive a corner 
in terms of line speed and, and closeness. And I think it comes down to risk and, and skill levels. So you've got Alex who has like a 99% consistency in touring car. Um, his kind of dispersion or, or deviance away from uh, where he's aiming at is, is a very small thing. Whereas me with a mod 12 scale um, is likely to be a much bigger variance of where I'm aiming to where the car actually ends up. So if you're on a super high tariff corner that if you crash on the inside of it is going to send your car off into the pits and no one's going to be able to retrieve it and it's going to be totally broken, um, I would probably give that a little bit of a wider berth than something that's like super slow speed, um, a chicane with a flapper or even better dots, right? Because as as we've seen at the Eastbourne National, when they started using dots two years ago or, or last year or whenever it was, I was so much better um, average to best than I had been previously. And I think it was just because I could aim at the edge of the dot. And if I missed it by two inches, it just bobbled and, and carried on. Um, whereas if I was aiming at a hard apex and I missed it by two inches, the car would have been off the track. So that's my theory. I'm pretty sure. No. I'm pretty sure that there are other top, that there are top level drivers that f think the same way because I have heard people say things and have seen people drive differently at different times, like doing enough to for the situation taking risk when they need to take risk if they're you know last lap or whatever and, and need to make up half a second uh, yeah uh, i i think that it, it it's where you, it, it first of all it's where you feel most comfortable isn't it i mean uh, primarily if you're eight inches away from the barrier at an apex and you feel comfortable there and you can do that all the way around the track you'll go a certain pace if you, yeah. you then go six inches closer to the eight, consistently all around the track you'll go a bit faster and so on and so on and so on and what yeah. you're saying is at specific points of the track where there's not a marshal you might want to give that a wide berth is fundamentally what you're saying I, I, I think to manage where you're going to crash isn't isn't the way the best drivers think i think their assessment of the whole track is of a certain type rather than any particular corner that's what my instinct would be initially but i think there's two forms of mindset i think there's your racing mindset and there's your qualifying mindset and i think that mindset changes during a day i think at the start Ah, I think the guys would be more conservative, learning the track, knowing what's what. And as the day goes on, they might start to push the envelope and evaluate where they sit in the grand scheme of things. And then, as we know, in sort of a round four is when invariably the track is quicker. I think that's when they might push the envelope a touch further. And then I think they'll come back off of that put you know, the foot on the gas in their final. And I think that might change. So I don't think there's a, a flat line of application of I'm never going to go close to that, Ben, because if I crash, I'll get it wrong and, and I'll come off and it'll cost me. I think I don't think you've got that ability to to have that much of a... <sighs> being that far away from an apex or being that far away from a barrier. Um, in any given area because I think you just lose too much time if you're going to give it the wide berth but the wide berth of a, of a top driver might be unconceivable to the naked eye but it's something that they feel that makes them feel more comfortable and then they'll drive the whole track better because they feel more comfortable but the reality might be that actually they're not really giving it that much more of a wide berth a perceivable wide berth but I think with what we're talking about, I crash a lot. 
I don't think I've got the ability to go from driving one inch further away from the apex because if I had that ability, I wouldn't have hit the apex in the first place. Yeah. So, it, so it feels like I either do my point one closest to Dave or it's point six away from Dave. I don't think I've got the ability to go. Point three a lap slower than Dave. Point four a lap slower than Dave. Point six because I only know flat out or you know, half on the gas. Yeah. So, so I, I don't think it's a conscious decision to place the car two inches away from the the apex. But I yeah. think it's. I think it'd be two inches. Obviously, you know just to give a measurement but I don't think it, I don't think it's a conscious thing to place the car at any distance from the apex no no what I'm questioning is your your aim of being as close as possible to every apex yeah because you you hit the inside of loads of corners and overall we are racing for eight minutes five minutes whatever and there has to be a, an appropriate level of risk. It's like everything in life, right? It's there's an appropriate level of risk for the mm. best overall result. So I think if you were 0. 0.6 yeah, yeah. of a lap slower than David, you would have had a better overall result. Which would have not satisfied me in the same way of being 0. 0.1 slower than him on a hot lap. Yeah, yeah. And and I've and we've spoken about this a lot. In no uncertain terms, if you cannot put in a fast lap, you cannot achieve what you want to achieve. I mean, I want to be, an, I want to win the national, and and I'm very comfortable with saying that. And my drive is to go as fast as I can over a lap, and if that shows me that I can, then compete. Because the minute it feels like to me, the minute I match the TQ guy on Saturday over a hot lap then I'll turn to consistency yeah. because I'll know I can go round a whole given track at the same pace as he can. Now, all I've got to do is for eight minutes. So that's the kind of way my mind works. I, I, then I'm, I'm not interested in lasting for eight minutes. <laughs> no, <I wasn't>. um, <laughs> you didn't need to say it. Everyone no, thought it. Yeah, eight minutes would be a result. But the, you know, lasting for eight minutes, I'm not really interested in that. I, I want to make sure I can I, I can compete pound for pound over a, over a lap, and I've and I've never and I've never been closer to that. So I, my mind is definitely, you know, steering to to what you were talking about. But I remember David, uh, on, David Spashit on a, on a few occasions. Um, he's walked off of an A final, and he's just looked at me. He said, "Just don't crash." Where he's not crashed and everyone else has around him and he's taken the final and that's yeah. ultimately that's all you got to do right at, at, you know again at the sharp end but he's got the ability to push the envelope as well go a little bit quicker and crash but it, equally um there's guys that can go quicker than david i believe and yet they can't cope with it for eight minutes not because of a physical the physicality of it, I think it's more of a, oh my goodness, it's Dave Spashit, I'm beating him, potential. You know, I think that's, uh, I think Dave holds a, a heck of a lot of weight when he's racing against people. And I think that's, that's, as, that's a big player in it as well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But interesting stuff. Um, so moving on to uh, the Chesterfield National, which you weren't at. No. Um, it was it was very good. The track, the track as usual was, was superb. Um, Andy Smith, Kevin Creaser was away in Florida, running at Snowbirds, so he wasn't. So it was down to Trevor Colt. He he obviously made a major role in in the event as well. Um, and so on Saturday. Uh, F1 stock. Holly Jeffries took the took the title, didn't he? Yep. And the overall uh, season championship. 
Yeah. Louis Parker was, was second and Matt Vara in third. That was so uh, that was a Schumacher Schumacher Roche deal. Uh, in the F two thirteen five, the final result was David Underwood, Steve Donald and Kenneth Rogers. All running a Schumacher. Uh, seventeen five final result. Uh, the overall champion was Marcus Askell. I think, oh no, it wasn't me, no. Um, Mark Sassel, obviously Schumacher as well. Mark Jewett was second. And, uh, um, again, both Schumachers. Um, modified result on Sunday. Ollie Jeffries won that as well. Uh, Andy Murray second. Adam Catchpole third. That was Schumacher, Schumacher Capricorn. And then the sports result on Sunday. Um, Mark Styles won. Ben Vincent second and Dave Spashit third. That was Roche, 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 which was nice to see. Um, it was it, you know, it was a good, it was another good weekend. Interestingly, um, I thought that the the track, it was it was uh, the same track that they ran before the Worlds and. I had wheel lift with my x-ray um, and it was exactly the same issue on Saturday, uh, rear wheel lift. And then on the Sunday when I ran the, the Eclipse, exactly the same deal with that as well, just battled with wheel lift. I'd never experienced that with my x-ray ever and I spoke to Andy Murray as well and he had never experienced wheel lift uh, at Chesterfield, I believe he said that. Um, so I think it was something about the layout of the track. I don't know what it was, but there was a couple of, there was a chicane in front of the rostrum that really caused the car to be unsettled. It was really strange. And so it was a, it was a, it was a tough weekend, but again, a, another enjoyable one and, and uh, some good close racing. Did you see any of the, any of the videos that uh, Kenneth Rogers posted up online? He does a good job of taking all the clips of the, 12 scale stuff i watched your crashes yes yes of course uh, yes that that took up uh, quite a lot of my time just analyzing each <laughs> each of the 35 I, crashes in eight minutes i like to crash like <laughs> i'm to sorry crash. i'm being mean uh no that's the only one i've watched so far i, I think they got posted last night so uh i will go through them all and yeah. have a look it's a bit weird when you know the result yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's understandable. Um, the uh, LNP committee needs a secretary, doesn't it? It does. We've uh, yeah. we've lost Richard Norris only as the secretary. He's still alive. Um, he's done a, an immense job um, as secretary since he took that over. Um, and I think that he'll be sorely missed. Uh, and everyone thanks him for his hard work. Um, but yeah, someone someone else needs to step up got your name written all over it and absolutely not not my cup of tea no barely got enough time to make a podcast and drive a toy car and watch all of those vrc videos anyway uh moving on <laughs> Um, any any thoughts? Any new? Anything else you would like to sort of cover personally? I am. Um, your last two weeks of uh, well, that hasn't hasn't it? Uh, uh, I've asked. No, go on. You start, and then I'll say what I want to say. <laughs> okay, I was just going to say, uh, seeing Adam Catchpole um, bounce back at at Chesterfield with his Capricorn, I think he had a, a hard time at um, the yeah. Worlds. Um, for very, you know, whatever reason, I, I don't know what the reasons were. I never spoke to him about it, but it was nice to see him come back from that. Um, now, an interesting one was Mark Styles running in sports, because um, Mark is to me, you know, modified 12th scale. Um, so seeing him switch classes um, after the Worlds, because no need to to do it anymore, I guess. Um, and then one, which which is is quite quite an interesting thing. Um, 
Now, obviously, a lot of Schumacher's on the podiums, every podium, uh, and some of them locked out. Um, but the sports podium was was all Roche, which I find quite interesting. My Roche in stock feels way better than my Roche in mod, um, you know, com- compared to other cars that I own or have owned. And um, and to me, it seems like it's really fast um, with a 13.5. So I'm, I'm kind of interested with your experience of the Eclipse, if we can somehow engineer it, that we can um, try each other's, uh, try a Roche and a, and a Schumacher back to back and see what we, we come up with. Because I find, I find it really difficult to believe that anything could be faster than my Roche. It's, it's, it was so night and day from my Yokomo for stock. Mm. Well, I think, I think that this probably is a moment when you want to get Tony Wade involved because he is quite good at driving two car uh, two cars around the track at the same time. <laughs> yes. Now that we're both on Samwa, we can um, we yeah. can bind to each other's yeah other's cars. Yeah. I love you, Tony. I'm only pulling your leg. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, isn't it funny? Isn't it funny how? Because I, I, when I went to New York and I took my two Yokomos, and my Yokomo was not very good in uh, in stock and it was it was amazing in in mod and and what is the reason for these cars that you know have a, a have a preference it's it's quite interesting isn't it um so yeah no that would be that'd be really cool to to back to back our two cars any other news for you um i wanted to ask you a question that you might not know the answer to what More car than- is um is andrew nat running now in 12 scale i thought it was a crc no so did i but i i i didn't see him on the crc um congratulations page oh so i don't know interesting well I'm, I'm well we'll send him a message wouldn't it be nice to get him on let's try and get him on yeah let's ask, let's ask him we need to we need to go transatlantic with this podcast that's I think what we need. Right. And yeah. I think once we break into the transatlantic market, <laughs> I think the sky's the limit. Next, next stop, Argentina, India. I mean, who? I mean, twelve scale in India could be big. Could be big. A lot of people. A there lot are of people a lot in. of people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say something, but I've forgotten what I was going to say. Uh, oh yes, that's what I was going to say. I'd just like to say a big thank you for all the nice people out there with the messages that they've sent me. I know a few people have sent you uh, comments on the podcast. Uh, it's been uh, gratefully received. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're having a bit of fun about the hobby that we enjoy and, and hopefully um, the trip up to nationals, hearing us to talk and chew the cud about RC is something that you enjoy and continue to enjoy. So yeah, so I just wanted to say a big thank you for the, for the people that that text me and, and pulled me aside at the national and said thanks and, and well done. Yeah, it is nice to hear because um, as I said in in episode one, I was uh, slightly concerned about the the possibility of complaints, um, and I've 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 had nothing but um, positive feedback. So thank you. Well, that pretty much rounds up the news. Let's move on. Interviews. Next on the show, um, needs no introduction. Uh, everybody knows him. He's been in the sport or the hobby for, would you believe, 50 years. Mr. Mar, Dave, Chris Wilkinson. Welcome to the show. Hi, Stu. Hi, Ant. Hello. Welcome. So, Christopher, obviously, uh, Ant and I spent... Uh, some good time with you at the Worlds just recently and uh, where we asked you to come on the show and thanks for coming along. So, and you have a question for, for Chris. Yeah. So, I mean, I found out a lot of things about you, Chris, at, at the Worlds after we'd uh, 
been eating food and, and drinking beers. But the thing that really stood out for me, apart from the, the amount of time you've been in the sport, was the amount of cars that you own. So, <laughs> so I am interested to know how many it is, because I, I just saw, you know, picture after picture, but we never actually talked about a number. So I'm interested in how many it is and, and how that collection came about. Well, the collection came about was, um, well, my dad likes to hoard things. I think I like to hoard things as well. So every time I got a car, I couldn't bear to get rid of it. So it started way back in probably 1970 with some of the old Mardave cars and some of the old PB cars. And I've just kept them ever since. And um i don't keep them at home for obvious reasons because everybody knows where i live um they're all stored there is a big percentage of them all nicely in boxes and some of them from championships and yeah i've got a fair few should we say (laughs) okay (laughs) lots where where, where did where did the, the passion originate from for radio control cars well, it started with boats when I was just six years of age. Um, and then we had Southampton Radio Control Car Club down there in Southampton and just sort of went along with my dad and saw some gas cars running around and thought, yeah, this is fun. And then many years later, um, I started racing with the likes of Bob Arrington, Steve, um, um, Keith Plested. Steve White, all massive names within the, the sport. And, yeah, we just started to go eight racing, really. Noisy buggers. You're, you're most notably known for, obviously, Mar Dave. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been involved with Mar Dave? And, and have, you, have, you, have you owned it from its inception or was, was someone before you? Oh, no. The Mar Dave was set up many, many years ago. Probably is, but has been going for 50 years this this year, last year. Um, I started, I was running Southampton Model Car Club and a guy called Darren Potter came up to me and said, uh, have you seen one of these little hot rods? And he put it on my desk at Race Control and just fell in love with good old oval racing there and then. Um, that was in 2005. Uh, me and um, Keith went off to the World Championships in Hereford in 2006 with with Mark Styles and co. Um, won the Oval Hot Rod Championship in 2006. And then I found out 2007 Mar Dave was for sale. And the rest is history, really. So 2007, I started with Mar Dave. Excellent. So... Um... Mardave as a company now, obviously you've you've still manufacturing various cars and and cars for different classes. What's what's the main things that you sell? What anything new on the horizon? Well, we're still working on GT12 because, as a few people know, that's where where it all started. I went along to Russ Giles at the um, LMP section and said, "Look, we're racing Mardaves on a circuit." And it's a natural progression to go from racing Mardaves on a circuit to maybe LMP is the next step. But I got this idea of putting GT shells on a Mardave. And Russ really liked it. Jim Spencer really liked it. And for the first few years, we were like a support class to LMP because they were going through a bit of a tricky patch at the time low numbers and we just sort of went along and were a support class now obviously lmp has grown massively and gt12 well that just went ballistic for a few years and that's sort of not died i think everybody keeps saying gt12 is dead but it's not it's still grassroots racing and people love it so so where where did did you get the idea for a, a the GT from anything in particular? Was it just that you had a car and you were running a GT shell? Did that originate from somewhere else? Or Well, no, we were running Mardays on a circuit and we were doing like um, a Marday GP at Hinkley and Steve Lander, 
uh, Richard Isherwood, Craig Dresh, uh, not Craig Dresher, Craig Dransfield. All of these names started off racing Mardaves on a circuit. And then the natural progression was, was to, look, let's get these people from Mardaves into a really fast class. Um, so we got the GT shell done from Keith um, and off we went. And the rest of it, we just, it just, just snowballed. Schumacher got involved. Spash it at Zen got involved. And yeah, it just grew so rapidly that it was hard to sort of keep up with the big boys. And for the last few years, Mardave really hasn't sort of been at the forefront because we can't afford to employ top class racers. We did have them all. We've had um, Adam Catchpole and likewise at racing for Mardave over the years. And yeah, it's been great. I just hope GT12 gets somebody strong at the top of their committee and continues to drive it forward because it's a great class. Yeah, so there's, there's two things came out, came out of that. So one, what, what do you get out of those top class drivers being part of, of your your team what what did Adam bring that that you're lacking now well Adam sort of brings people together you go along and race and you sit down sit down and sort of have a group of people it's like Stu he goes along he sits with his extra x-ray guys and they're they're like a community and the Roche people they all sit together and there's a community if we had some high class names in the Mardave camp, you would get the natural progression of people going along to their clubs. They have 10 or so cars with somebody at the head of that group of people and they all stick together. And if one decides he's going to go off and join Schumacher or Zen, then naturally the rest of them seem to follow. Yeah. And we haven't got somebody that is at that top of the field to move a load of people and keep Mardave going. Yeah, sure. So you, you said about someone strong at the at the helm of the GT section. Mm. What what do you think it needs? Apart apart from a, a strong person, what, what would that person need to do? As the class lost its way, was it something that that grew and because of its growth people went to lmp what what do you think i think it just grew so quickly and the gt12 cars evolved into lmp cars with smaller smaller tires i think from looking at what's going on in europe and germany we've got lmp cars now with gt12 uh, with gt shells on I even saw at Snowbirds, uh, Brian Wynn, I think, was running a, a GT shell on an LMP car. Yeah. I think maybe that's the progression that GT12 has to go. We need to keep the GT cars looking like GT cars. And if you want to go and take your LMP car and stick a GT shell on, maybe that's what it needs to to get it going again. I, I, I think that the belief that and I've said this a, a, a number of times to people that, that, that a GT12 car and an LMP car are fundamentally the same. Yeah. I, I, I think that's so far from the truth. When I, when I went from GT12 to 12 scale, uh, it was such a, a leap, I felt, uh, mm-hmm. and, and people almost move away from GT12 on uh, because they think oh well, it's just another LMP car and, and actually it, it, it's so it's, it's so much less than that but the, the racing experience is so much more arguably because the opportunity of tweak and all the variables that a 12 scale car needs to be looked at and, and administered is is huge so I, I the GT12 I think is it should be sold more on the back of how simple it is and how competitive it can be rather than it being just another or scaled down 12 scale but then if you look at a schumacher now yeah a schumacher is is so basic you've got tony wade and co 
going out there week after week with a Schumacher and doing reasonably well and consistent. Um, Ollie Jeffries at the top of the field. They've just down won the 12th LMP Worlds with technically a GT12 car with wide tyres on. OK, so you've it's... my argument out the water there. Other than that... Sorry, Stu. Sorry. <laughs> No. I, didn't, I didn't mean to blow you out of the water. That, that, that's why we've got you on. That's why we've got you on. But, uh, but no, you, but you're absolutely right. And I think that's and I, when when we had Andy Murray on the show uh, last time, that the, the the progression to go from an atom to a uh, you know to an eclipse mm. is is almost seamless. And you're getting two scales of two types of racing in the same scale. Yeah. I think, and I think we're going to see a, a big evolution of of how these cars look going forward so that you can make it perform as good as the the eclipses without all necessarily the the, the different uh modifications that you can or, or want to make of a current Tosco car yeah and looking down the field it wasn't just the Reinhards that were going well with a basic car you look down the field that the, the team of Schumacher had some young lads that were doing really well because the car was consistent where I struggled a little bit because I had a Roche and it was quite complicated and little tiny changes made huge gains but knowing what to do with those minute changes was not something I was sort of comfortable with. I did take my Mardave along and I was going to run it. I wish I had now purely because that would have pointed me in the right direction of maybe we should get the Mardave back out as an LMP car. And then if GT12 does evolve into an LMP car with a GT12 shell on it, we're already there. But hindsight is a wonderful thing. Yeah, sure, sure is. So on the... Um... So GT12, I, I I did GT12. That's how I started in um, in tw- you know foam tire, 12 scale racing. And to me, when I started, it was um, a relatively simple class to get involved with. Apart from tire truing, everything else seemed relatively straightforward. You didn't really need to do a whole bunch on setup. You just ran it as it came out of the box, and it was you know quick enough with the the heavy car and the narrow tires that that you had to learn to drive it and then pretty rapidly over the course of a few months the next evolution of gt cars came out um and it seemed like there was some the 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 kind of price rule that was in to start with that kept everything basic went went away and the cars became i know you're saying they're simple cars but they became basically now what the world championship 12 scale cars are and it was a, an arms race <clears throat> in terms of technology and drivers and people were throwing um healthy budgets at motors and batteries and, and for me that's where it it lost its differentiator between it and lmp and really they became like a, a poor performing LMP to me because you had all the power, but you had these awful tires and, and not enough downforce. So do you think that going back to a, a slower formula a, a, or a more tightly controlled formula would, would bolster the, the class again, rather than going towards the, the LMP style of, of 12, uh, GT12? I think it's a diffi- if it's a very difficult one to sort of quantify I, I thought by getting GT12 going, people will see the Ollie Jeffries and the Spashets and all of that racing LMP on the same day as racing a GT12 car. And they look and go, this, is, this little kid turns up and he goes, that's who I want to be like. I want to get to his level. So if you make the car slower, you detune them all you're not going to get the likes of smash it and ollie and all of that lot at a meeting racing a car because it just it just wouldn't 
be something that they want to do. So the natural progression of all of the children and the kids coming through, you're not going to have them looking up to smash it and say, I want to beat him. I want to be as fast as him. So it's, it's so hard to understand which way GT12 should go, but you still need the top drivers from these teams at those meetings for the beginners to look and that's what they want to get to. When when um, when you were more deeply entrenched in GT12, was it a big part of your revenue at the time? Massive. When when Zen and Schumacher joined in, like I say, everybody said, "Oh, Schumacher is just going to dominate, and Zen are just going to dominate, and poor old Marde is just going to stay by the wayside." But for two or three years, it was the best years we ever had because. GT12 just grew and we still had some really good drivers racing for us. And when we did the GT12 Worlds, um, Steve Lander put his Mardave in the top six. Ben Vincent was there. But unluckily, before the Worlds, Ben joined Schumacher. But if he had stayed with Schumacher, who knows what could have happened? Um yeah, they were great years, but we don't look back. We only look forward. And Mardave is still going. I'm still busy. We're still making other cars other than GT12 cars. And, yeah, we're happy. And have you got a GT12 in the pipeline, potentially? Is that something you could talk about? Yes, yeah, we've got GT12. GT12. We've been playing around with different bits and pieces. We obviously... <laughs> like all the other manufacturers look at other people's cars and why have they done that and why have they done this um yeah we're still playing but to get to that top level we need somebody that would drive it once i release it and i honestly can't see anybody out there that would jump ship from one of the big three and come and race with us well if, if, there, is, if there is someone out there that that wants to drive it you know yeah, yeah get in touch get in touch so so what's what's the other avenues of, of Marde? i mean obviously we, we spoke at uh the worlds and stock car and banger racing was is a big part of your your business yeah talk us a little bit about that well for many years we've been doing mini stocks um which is uh for people that don't know is a flat chassis very similar to a Schumacher, um, for a sing- simple pod with no diff and suspension at the front. Um, it's much shorter than a GT12 car, but we have clubs up and down the country. Yorkshire Mardave. Um, yeah, there's, there's so many clubs up and down the country racing these little Mardave cars. And they're getting 20 odd people on a Friday night. They're having really close championships because the car you can't do anything with it you run a standard g2 motor with a bog standard speed controller some of them are even controlling the servo that it's got to be a 10 pound servo a standard mini lexan body shell and they're all racing around really close craig mawson and uh, co up at yorkshire mardave They go racing and love it. So that's a big part of our business. And we've just got back into F2 stock cars with Morgan Williams. A lot of you remember Morgan, young lad, made it into the main final at the Worlds at Milton Keynes. He's our current world and European champion for F2 stock cars. And a couple of weeks ago, he joined Mardave to help me with development of the F2 and yeah we TQ'd at the round two of the uh, F2 championships last weekend and we won on the Saturday in the thing called um, the Golden Helmet doesn't sound too good does it Golden Helmet <laughs> <laughs> but um, we have a stand motor a set of Schumacher striped rear tyres and a free choice of front tyres and we're doing like 102 laps 
in five minutes. So, oh, God. yeah, sub three second laps, fast <laughs> and furious. But I think that's where we're going, really. Back to, back to our roots, oval racing. It's always been busy. And, uh, yeah, you either love it or you hate it. Yeah, so that, that kind of formula, uh, which y- you were saying, running mile Dave's on a circuit, mm-hmm. that to me, what you're describing there, sounds absolutely perfect for a beginner circuit class. You know, 12 yeah. scale cars that are basic and simple. I raced um, Tammy on a on a Friday night in the local village hall. And I think that what you're describing there would be absolutely perfect in, in the same sort of sort of scenario. That's right. I think Basildon used to run Tamiya Minis and they've now 90 percent of the club have gone over to the little assassin mini and they're getting 15, 20 people just racing the Mardave Mini. They've ditched yeah. the Tamiya and they're racing Mardave Minis. Yeah. So. Excellent. So you mentioned that you took your uh, your Mardave 12 to, to the Worlds and I saw yeah. it um, yeah. because we sat back to back to each other mm-hmm. um so what what is it about what's the design principles why why is it simple what what made you feel that you, you should have run it now well i know i've been running it at um risby on a monday night which is a little club i go to and i've been running it there for a few weeks it, it, it's it's just something i understand it's it's a standard car it, it's not dictated by a little tiny shim here and a little shim there and springs they're the standard Marde springs that we use so I understand what they all are so for me to do something to the car I would instantly know in my head this is what I got to do rather than go cap in hand to team Roche and say what do I do next or yeah. just give it to Lee Moss who was my pit bitch for the day or the week and Lee, what do I need to do? And he used to say, put a washer here, change this, change that, go out. Yeah, that's better. Um, yeah, I should have stuck. I should have stuck with it, but yeah, I didn't. Yeah. So it's just that that familiarity of, yeah. of knowing where you are, and yeah, yeah I, can, I can see that. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's been lovely having you on, Chris. Is there anyone you want to thank, or any sponsors that you want to? mention well the missus is my biggest sponsor <laughs> she <laughs> she lets me, she lets me go out racing and uh my daughter always says daddy can you come back with a trophy um that becomes harder as you get older because all these young whippersnappers are out there snapping at your heels all the time yeah but no thanks for having me on um met a lot of people in this sport over the years and yeah it's been a massive part of my life. I don't know how many more years I shall be competing, but yeah, long may it continue and good luck to everybody I know. Marvellous. Thanks a lot. Thanks good so to much. speak to you all. Thank you. Smash it, speed secrets. New segment uh, sponsored by Zen Racing. It's Smash it's speed secrets. A little section of that uh, Dave Spashit, uh, four and a half times world champion, uh, will be giving us uh, some insights into how you can go a bit quicker on the track. So I'd like to welcome on the show, Dave Spashit. Thanks you for coming. Do. You're all right. Very good. Very good. So tonight, Dave, uh, we want to cover Caster. Now, you are involved with a, a book. Uh, the author is Dave Stevens, and you are the official technical contributor to the essential 12th scale and f1 racers guide which is uh, out now and can be purchased where can they purchase the book dave uh direct off of his website or off of our website fantastic so uh, let's talk about caster um for those that don't know what caster is uh, can you give us a, a a quick rundown on on what caster is yeah basically um caster is the angle of the front kingpin um, as it leans towards the rear of the car from vertical, um, measured in measured in degrees off the ground. And for a standard 12 scale car, where where would that sit as a bit of a default measurement for a car that you would typically run? Yeah, so 
12 scale generally is four to six degrees. That's kind of the general norm. We, we always try other stuff. Um, people try different setups, but generally we always end up back between four and six. And how does this affect the steering and the turning of the car generally? So the, the more you increase the caster, so um, the greater the uh, kingpin leaning back towards the back of the car, um, car generally goes straighter, easier, enters the corner easier. But then as you go through the corner and wind the lock on, as long as you have tyre grip, assuming you have traction at all times, the more cast you have, the more the car will want to turn towards the middle and end of the corner. Now, the reason I say that is grip dependent, obviously, is because what comes first is the beginning of the corner. And if you have too much caster and not enough grip, you can get yourself in a right pickle with setup if you actually run too much caster. Been there, Dave. Been there with that. Um... <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, I have, you know, I have guys come up to me and say, oh, I need more steering and I'm up to 10 degrees of caster. <laughs> and I said, well, you don't actually need more steering. What you're struggling with now is you've gone past the limit and you mm. can't actually get the car into the corner. You're not actually initiating the corner properly. So reduce, reduce, your, cat, reduce your caster, get the car to turn in so you, at least you have turn in to start with and then find the limit of where you can go. And in 12 scale, as I said, generally it's always between four and six degrees. And you're you're always um building the caster around the grip or are you building the grip around the caster yeah as you as you know when you go racing the grip level generally always comes to the basic basically the same level we race on the same style of carpets now up and down in the uk by midway through saturday the grip is pretty consistent Therefore, your canvas, your camber and your caster setting ends up being pretty much the same all the time. Um, a little tweak here and there, potentially, maybe. But if I'm truthful, it's something I very rarely change. And I think that's that's quite a, a reliable tip to go with. So if if by Saturday, a, a national meeting, you're still messing around with the caster, maybe you're not quite on the right scent of how to improve your your car's speed yeah again i mean if you if you want to go and get get that book we just mentioned in there there's a couple of um uh, race meetings that have been written down by by some guys and how they go about their days racing and one thing they all all pick up on is they don't chase the track if they know the track will evolve and they know the grip will come to them to a degree they won't chase it they'll wait um, and again, that's just trusting, trusting your previous experiences of when you go racing, really. Yeah. And, and um, on reactive caster, how does how does that sit um, with caster? What's happening there? I mean, reactive caster is obviously also dependent on your suspension compression, because as the suspension compresses, um, you can have the caster be removed from the car. So reactive caster. Um, if you in, if you increase the reactive caster angle, it will make the car react faster and it'll increase the way you can enter a corner. If you decrease the reactive, it'll make the car easier to drive, smoother when entering corners, and it'll be more consistent because you're having less changes as you go through a corner. So the Again, we, we, we generally run five degrees or seven degrees of reactive you can go to 10 some cars can go to 10 some can go to 12 but between five and seven degrees of reactive is kind of the norm so if someone was going to be at a national event say at uh, chesterfield is coming up uh where where would you advise them to sit there five Stat degrees five degrees on on both would be a good on starting both. point yeah Fantastic. Dave? It, I mean, honestly, it really, with, with the caster setting, it's, I, I see a lot of people always try, trying it, changing it, doing this, that and the other. And this worked really well this week and I'm really happy with it. Then you watch them through the day of a national start to struggle. And it's because the grip has changed and they always end up back with the basic settings. <laughs> Going around in circles is what you're trying to say, really, aren't it? <laughs> well, we all do it. We all do yeah. it. 
because we all want to find that something or and it's not just casters with everything we always want to find something that's going to make us better than the guy sat next to us it's just we're all racers and we want to find that edge but reality of a 12 scale car nine times out of ten if you look at any car that's won anything they're generally always the same david as ever whenever i speak to you always insightful uh, we thank you for your time and uh, we look forward to you coming on the next show and giving us some more insights into spash it's speed secrets sponsored by zen racing thanks for your All time right, thank you very much cheers thank you interviews so next on the show uh is a super talented uh, rc driver who we all know a 14 time british champion uh ollie jeffries welcome to the show ollie thanks for having me have i got that right ollie is it 14 times you won the british champion you've been a um, british champion no it's 12 no. i mean no. hopefully it will be 14 at some time at some yeah. point but yeah at the moment it's 12 um across 12 scale and touring car across 12 scale and touring car yeah that was my fault sorry well <laughs> Do you know what? I wasn't going to point the finger at, but I'm glad you fessed up. Bad, bad <laughs> maths. It's, it's my fault. Now, now, Ollie, um, I'm sort of semi-new to this whole RC world thing. I mean, I, I've been doing it four or five years, and um, I first came across you at Paul National a few years ago when no, it wasn't. It was at uh, Newbury National, 12 scale. Uh, you turned up in your skinny tight jeans, um, looking. <laughs> looking like a, a professional talking to Dave Spashit and uh, and then I ask a few questions to a few people about who you are and obviously seen you do lots of different things uh, Google you and YouTube and all that kind of stuff you're a bit of a I would say you're the English equivalent of uh, Mark Reinhardt uh, is my perception of you because uh, you don't say a lot I think you're quite a quiet lad uh, but you're insanely good um so <laughs> i'm extremely excited and i know Anne is uh, to interview you what uh, how did you start in rc racing um so my i'm trying to think back now my mum used to work with somebody whose son did it um and i basically went along for poof, it was a good few months just sort of watching um and i think I remember my dad saying if I could save my Christmas money till my birthday in May, he would put like the rest towards it to get my sort of, I guess, ready to run car. They weren't called ready to run cars then, but, you know, your sort of first kit with your basic bits and pieces you need to go racing. Um, and I think he, he clearly saw I wanted to do it because I usually a kid at that age would the money would sort of burn a hole in his pocket. Um, but yeah, eventually he sort of gave me the rest I needed to buy my, Tamiya, I think it was. Um, and then, yeah, pretty much probably raced most weeks since that day. Um, but my dad's been in, he used to do a lot of rallying and stuff. So I've always been into motorsport as such. But obviously, doing this is much safer. So he was probably quite happy when I took up doing this rather than trying to <laughs> kill myself cheap. in a full size car. Yeah. Well, he thought it'd be <laughs> cheaper. Probably at the start, he realized it's not. <laughs> And um, at what point did you realise you might be a bit better than the average bear? Um, I don't think I ever think of it that way. I think it, you probably realise at one point where you, or you realise actually I really want to do well at this more than I think I could be good at it, if that makes sense. It's more of a want to do well than I'm good enough to do well. Because um, I think you only get out of something what you kind of put in i don't really believe in somebody's just talented and that's all it is kind of thing um but i remember when i did a race it must have been for oh, like 2000 or something so it was like my first sort of year running out outdoors or out of my local club um and i had some old yokomo touring car which my dad i can't remember what part it was but he basically bodged a bit of it back together because we didn't have the right parts to fix it and it failed on like the last it was either like the last corner or the last lap of the i don't know whatever it was like the d final or something um yeah i was i was broken after the race because it was i was about to win like my first final if you like outside of my local club um so i think i always remember that day and i think my dad does as well because he probably saw 
actually, I do care about this. Um, mm. Ever old I was then. Um, so yeah, that was probably that was probably the day I thought actually no, this is I do really want to do well at it. Um, but I never thought, oh, I'm I'm good at this kind of thing. Um, yeah, I kind of viewed it the other way really. Cool. So that that um, <clears throat> work ethic and putting in the effort to to improve. You you wrote in one of your uh, RC Racer articles about using VRC for practice to to get you out of a a spell where you were d- you were doing something that you you perceived to be incorrect and then you uh, you came out the other side with a win straight away. So do do you use VRC regularly or is it just to solve a problem and, and what other things do you kind of use to, to get better and, and carry on getting better? Um, the VRC, I remember that. I think it was, um, yeah, it was sort of three years ago or something. I can't remember what it was, but I remember, obviously I worked quite closely with Marcus um, on things like my driving, um, you know, driving style. And what he's good at is watching other people and say, okay, that person in that corner kind of does this, um, which then I'll try and do myself. So, I think that's probably one of my strengths is a having somebody like Marcus who can help with that, but trusting somebody that you can then, you know, trust what you're trying to adapt your driving to is the right thing. Um, I can't remember what it was. I do remember that VRC thing, but I don't really use VRC. I I had it on my computer and I just played it around with some stuff. It might have been something like on my handset, like the way it was, um, like the trigger position or something like that yeah. or the stick sorry um yeah i can't remember exactly what it was but I, I don't use vrc um yeah it's not something i use regularly um, i can't remember the last time i i've used it so i think just driving a car in the real world um i think vrc is good for especially if you're a beginner and you just want to get the sort of you yeah, the basic bits um sorted but it's a bit like racing a computer game formula one computer game you don't have that real world element to it um yeah so yeah it's not something i would use to practice but i do remember that i'm pretty sure it was something on my like a setting in terms of the way my handset felt um which then allowed me to to drive a bit differently um but a lot of it is sort of if you think you feel comfortable with something that's yeah that's one of the biggest bits if you if you have a doubt on something and you can find a way to fix it as long as you believe that doubt's gone then then you're all right yeah sure so with with, um you know we see you up on the rostrum before a race and you your eyes are tracing around the the track and you you stand in exactly the same way every time holding your transmitter in the same way what what sort of things do you do is that a visualization thing do you do things off the track to to kind of work on that? And that's interesting, that's because I never really realised I did that until Marcus pointed it out. Um, I don't really know how long I've sort of done that sort of thing for. Um, I don't really picture driving around the track. I think it's just a way of sort of once I'm up on the the driver's stand, my way of like, okay, I'm up here now and there's nothing else to think about. Um, once I've done that. I kind of feel like I'm on my own now and I can go race kind of thing. So it's more of a way of sort of one thing we do have in our sport is you're around all the people you're racing against all the time. Um, also, before you go up onto a, a driver's stand, you're pretty much stood with the people you're about to do battle with, if you like. Um, so it's quite easy to sort of get into conversations and talk rubbish as people do before a race, which I try to avoid and sort of keep myself to myself, if you like. But I think that thing I do is just to sort of almost like zero yourself before you go to race. Um, you know, even if you've had a bad run the, the race before, if you kind of prepare yourself the same every time, it doesn't really matter if you've had a good or a bad run before that, because you kind of start in the run in exactly the same mindset, yeah. if that makes sense. Um but again, it's like a, it's a personal thing. Like I couldn't say that works for me and you know, somebody else should try it and it would work for them because some people, maybe their way of dealing with it is to have a good chat before they race. Um, 
but also what I find it is useful for, um, especially indoor races, is you can pick up things like if the tapes come up on a corner, um, which sounds quite basic, but if it can't be fixed before the start of the race, you, you're at least aware of maybe a track marker that's moved or a bot dot that's moved or something. So it's, it's quite handy for that as well. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to come back to the whole improving driving and your thoughts on that, because I think that's... Uh... That's a topic that is is close to my heart and, and certainly Ants, and I'm sure a lot of the guys and girls that, that listen out there. But uh, let, let's just talk a little bit about your your days at X-Ray. Uh, you were there for five seasons. I, I run X-Ray. And I, again, I remember you saying that I was very blue one evening because uh, <laughs> I had blue trainers on a blue T-shirt on, t-shirt on. And I said to you that you used to be blue, but that was when you went to Schumacher. So, um, <laughs> so your your time at X Ray for five seasons, how was that for you? Because they have a lot of headline drivers, don't they? I mean, obviously yourself, Alex, Bruno, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How was that working alongside Alex under Alex? How was how was that uh, situation for you? Um, it was good. I mean, it's you. I was always aware that. You know, Alex and Bruno are the you know, paid drivers and they're the, the top guys. So what it also was good, I mean, especially when Alex moved to the UK, was it, it gives you a good reference point. Um, you know, I'm the sort of person who would, I'd rather finish last knowing I've raced the best people than win because people haven't turned up kind of thing. So mm-hmm. when Alex came to the UK, I saw that more of a, a, a chance for me to improve. Um, and also it, you know, you can you can always learn, you know, from those guys who who are doing it I say every day of the week, but you know, almost every day of the week. Um, you know, even though I've raced for a long time, they've they've got more experience of things I haven't got. So um yeah, you can learn a lot from them and yeah, I did over those however many years I raced for them and then I think Alex was probably in the UK for a, a couple of years towards the end, I think. Um but it was also good seeing Alex in our environment if you like because a lot of the times when you go to ets races and big races you're you're at a disadvantage to a degree where you haven't been able to go say to like the hoodie arena and test for a handful of days so it was kind of nice to zero that and you always want to prove yourself which is which is nice and obviously against your teammates with the same equipment um mm. so i'm sure he learned also quite a lot from the uk races which he probably wasn't familiar with um you know even twasca which you think twasca on a piece of carpet is the same wherever you go but you, you're just in a different environment again so it was good I, I enjoyed it and yeah i had a good time with them and yeah i got a lot of respect for the the guys racing there and obviously all the the brand itself because it's, it's obviously quite impressive what they've what they've got and 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 obviously now moving on you you've moved to schumacher um how does that differ from your time at x-ray do they do things differently dramatically or is it pretty much the same principles that they they run to um i mean it's similar in a sense that you've obviously got multiple classes um obviously uh, x-ray is, is a bigger company in that respect so the the classes and the the drivers there's more of it um but yeah i mean essentially you're trying to develop products to win races um so obviously the the main difference is working with guys you're in the same country as um which doesn't it sounds quite simple but actually makes quite a big difference um you know communication is slightly different because you can interpret something differently if it's not your first language um but yeah if you're talking like you'd be talking to your mates it's it's easier in that respect um but yeah it's it's very it's very different to i think if you change to any team even if you know it's it's not a british team or it's a japanese team or whatever there's always everybody does things differently um but when i joined schumacher obviously i knew the guys pretty well before that because you see them more often because you're racing with them most weekends um so it's good i mean we managed to win the championship last year um it was quite a close battle with Elliot throughout the season um I think we worked out the other day that out of every time we went on track qualifying and finals um me and him won every single race if you like apart from one round of qualifying at Cotswolds which um I think Zach Smith won so any final or qualifying round me and him 
topped. So it was a pretty intense battle all year, but it was good to, to get the win at the end. Um, and obviously the Twasco Championship, we won on the Chesterfield two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, and potentially been able to win the modified one as well. So, yeah, a couple of ch- uh, national championships is a pretty solid year. Not yeah. bad at all. Um, you talked about being able to go to a, a facility three or four days before and practice. And I, I've done a little bit of touring car, um, mostly indoors, but I've been to a few different outdoor tracks and, and I've struggled to uh, to kind of get my car to work at, at those tracks and in particular with additive as, as I know quite a few other people have and anecdotally um, I've heard that you're pretty good with the old additive and <laughs> people um, have given you their car and you've gone off to your tent and, and given them their car back and it's it's been epic so is there anything you can tell without giving away any secrets for beginners who are traveling to, to different tracks who haven't had a chance to practice you know kind of a starting point of, of what they should be doing but most importantly ollie feel free to let away some secrets as well <laughs> well that's the <laughs> i don't actually know where this i say this additive thing came from um i don't remember g- <laughs> taking people's cars off them and doing that um but yeah i think i mean if you look also in twelve scale um my first laps are always probably my strongest um but yeah we all have the same additive because it's controlled um i think some the additive things come about a little bit because i think my strong point is my first couple of laps so i think at times it appears like i've maybe got good additive but i re- being honest i don't have any magical stuff there's nothing i use that you can't buy um i mean suppose most of the races once we go indoors are all hand out additive anyway um so it's only those outdoor races that we run um i think last year with the sweep tire we used was tricky not so much to get the additive right but just to get the car feeling right on new tires um and i think they're a bit inconsistent where you could maybe have a set that your car felt really nicely balanced but you could put another set on it the balance would move one end or the other um I think the key is keeping it simple. I think people can overcomplicate additive or they start testing things like additive like too early in the day when the track's all sort of green and not rubbered in. Um, and I think the key is just to write everything down, really. Um, you start to sort of build up. Like, I know if I went testing tomorrow at Cotswolds, um, you have a rough idea what you should be doing with the tyre. Um but there's never a magic thing that works everywhere, every time on every tire. Um, you're generally fine. I bet if you took the top 10 or 20 and everybody put their additive on the table in a normal bottle, we'd probably all be using pretty much the same stuff. Um, yeah. It's probably maybe how you use it is is quite important. Um, I see a lot of people, especially when people start out, they, okay, I'll go buy this bottle of additive, spend you know an hour putting it on warming your tires and then they go put the car on on the dirty part of the track um so your nice hot sticky tire has just got covered in dust and little stones and things like that or they pop it in the pit lane um maybe because they don't have a pit man to sort of put it on the track so in a way having a guy with you to help you do that is probably more important than the additive itself um it's basically all your hard work's undone as soon as you put the car in the you know offline effectively um yeah. one thing with rubber tires people don't do is keep them sealed in rubber bags it's like the opposite to foam tires with with twasco you tend to leave them so they can dry out um but with rubber tires you don't want them to dry out because then they you know rubber's like a living thing um even though some of the tires we use aren't you know full rubber they're obviously a bit plasticky um if you leave a set of tires like on your your shelf and come back to them in a week they, they're like rock hard um so yeah if you want to reuse tires um keeping them in a sealed bag or you know packed away in a box so no sunlight on them does make a big difference and yeah that kind of stuff is way more important than the the additive you're putting on on the day yeah Um, that's probably the best advice for people just and also ask if if you're ever a national obviously i wouldn't go ask 
the guy I'm directly racing against, what attitude you use, because if you have maybe found something that's slightly better than something else, you're not going to want to give that away if you spent some time testing. Um, but I'd be very surprised if anybody had anything magic, you know, they've made at home in their big sort of pot in the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or at least I, I don't have that anyway. No. <laughs> Anytime I asked anyone what, what to do, it was always MR33 for 20 minutes. So, uh, I, I <laughs> yeah, stopped it was asking cars, after a MR33 while. MR33 <laughs> and FX2 was always, if you, you could go anywhere with that and it would always be good. Yeah. Um, it seems in the, newer kind of tires we're using seem to uh prefer like a carpet additive like the thinner stuff um but the tires have changed again for this year because it's the volante tire so again we'll have to sort of relearn that in a way yeah um, but yeah there's i don't i don't really don't know where this magic additive thing came from but i've had people say it to me oh you must have some special additive but i don't <laughs> uh, I, w- I won't tell you my source but um I might tell you at some point. So, uh, <laughs> um, so the Schumacher car, the the MI7. So it's yeah. it looks to be a, a fairly conventional mid motor car, uh, you know, asymmetric top deck. Um, apart from the the lower arms and the with the carbon ones and the uh, it's kind of got a Yokomo style, twelve scale style top arm. Is there anything else unusual about the car? Um, anything else that you think is a particularly strong point anything you'd like to change um i mean currently it's a ours is probably the only actual mid motor car um the other cars are mid lay shaft so the motor's still not in the middle of the car because it sits behind the spurger um where our car actually is a mid motor car um so the motor's in front of the spurger um but what was cool in the kit you actually had the option of both um i think the first batch of kits came with the rear motor chassis and also the mid motor chassis um, and it uses the same motor mount so you can just change the chassis move the motor mount back and the top deck and obviously change the belts and you, you got yourself a i say a conventional car but now all cars are kind of mid motor if you like um so yeah that's probably the even though it doesn't look that different it actually is quite a big difference because obviously the motor's quite a heavy part of the car to to move even moving during testing, we moved the motor, I think, from one of the chassis to another sort of 1.5 mil or something like that. Or it might have been, might have been a couple of mil, but it was it was a huge difference on track. Um, so it's you know anything that weighs that much when you move it is going to have a, a big effect. Um, yeah, the, the top arms are. We tested a lot with sort of the automatic style top arm, um, but it was kind of felt that would the top arm we've got now would be a little sort of user friendly for the average club guy. Um, so you don't have the caster and the camber adjustment in it. It's just camber. Um, and then you can adjust the caster with the top plate. Um, so it's a little bit more simple for the, for the club guy. If he does, you know, a lot of times you race uh, your local club, you might only have three or four heats. So what you don't want to do is if you do have a bump, spend, you know, 15 minutes trying to straighten all the camber and, uh, the cast right which i'm not sure the other cars have that issue but it is a potential problem if you if you did you know have a big bump so um, that was the sort of reason for that style top arm um and obviously it's, it's nice and strong too yeah. um yeah i mean the development was quite sort of when you're doing it in public at races um you're obviously conscious of you go to a race because you want to win the race. Um, but kind of the best place to test stuff is at a race when you're against everybody else. Um, you know, I could go to Cotswolds tomorrow, which is only half an hour for me, drive around all day, try and a hundred different things. And at the end of it, you still wouldn't know if it was, you know, as good as the, the guy you're going to race against. Cause you don't know how good the track was that day. It's probably, you know, if it hasn't been cleaned up enough, you're never really going quite as quick as you would be on a, a national. Um, so again, the car isn't going quite into that window it normally would. Um, so it was good to be able to test during the national season. And each national, I think I've, I've basically ran a different car every national uh, or a different variation of the car. Um, when we started, it would have been 
obviously the the motor at the back of the car um and then i think middle of the season or a couple of nationals in we moved the motor a few millimeters forward and changed some other stuff and it wasn't until the last national that um they brought the the mid motor car which is actually i think even a week or two before the last national it wasn't it wasn't really thought of it was a well that's the next thing to try and then we we brought that to the national and then and won which gave us a championship so well it kind of it was nice to finish the championship with the win and win you know if you take the overall championship as well so um in doing that obviously you have some ups and downs because you'll try stuff that maybe doesn't work or you'll go down a route the setup which doesn't work and it's hard to come back during a, a race meeting um because you're kind of committed to going one way um so yeah there was times where it was it was difficult but obviously the end result was was winning which was good i think that's a, an important part that you the point you bring up there ollie about that the whole testing yeah, people go away and say, oh, I'm going to go away and test. And uh, uh, the, the track, um, unless it's permanent and indoors and it's had a race meeting the day before, how few places that you can actually get some viable data points with any kind of prototype parts. It, it's, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, is, that, is that your generalised view of it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably... I mean, Twasco is the same. To test Twasco is basically, like you said, impossible because you compare it to a national grip level. Um, yeah. If you're trying to test setup stuff, I don't think you can. And it's, you know, outdoors, you've got things like weather, which mm. even if we spent all day at a track, came back again seven o'clock in the morning, you know, overnight wind would have blown dust on the track. Um, so it will clean back up again, but it does change quite a lot. So you you generally have to sort of not go around in circles, but if you if you are testing on your own, you'll you'll sort of try stuff and then you have to go back again to prove what you mm. felt. You know, you're sort of going backwards and forwards. So you could actually do maybe four or five runs where you're only testing the same thing, just taking it on and off the car. Um that's probably one thing or well, it's an easy mistake to make a, a track is you change the car. I think, oh, that was way better because I went faster. But you don't actually take it back off again, but the track could have gone faster. Yeah. You know, sometimes if you look at everybody else's performance, you see maybe they improve the same, you know, one or two tenths you did. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it is hard to test. And unless you've got a, like you said, like an arena 33 kind of thing where there's, I don't know how many laps that would have had on it when it was open. Um, well, you know, you could just put your car down and you've got that kind of level of grip. Um, you do find yourself having to sort of go backwards and forwards quite a lot. But we did some testing on Mondays after Nationals just because, you know, it's had the weekend running on it. So it's the closest you could get to to replicating the, the grip you had at the race. But even that, most of the time, it would never be quite the same because you had a hundred or so guys going around it um we're on the monday you've only got four or five so even though it's clean it's still not it's still not the same really um so yeah i'd always prefer to do okay testing in public you open yourself up for public failure if you like if you get it wrong um but it's it's the best way to learn i think which you saw it with automatics with the twas at the worlds mm. they probably knew they wasn't going to turn up and win the race but you go away with a good idea of where you're at, where if they were just going somewhere on their own, this feels good. And actually you turn up at the race and you go, oh, I'm nowhere, or I'm not as fast as I thought. So you got to run in you know, with the people you're racing against, really. It was interesting seeing the uh, development of the car and the kind of secrecy around it, hiding the, the cars at EWS and, and stuff. Um, talking about EWS... Outdoor versus indoor, have you got a, a strong preference for TC? Um, usually you spend the back end of the winter looking forward to going back outside. And then when you get to the end of the summer season, <laughs> oh, I really can't wait to go indoors. Um, I like both. I probably don't have a preference. I like the winter in the fact you can sort of, there's less sort of oh, say stuff to take, but you can just go to your local club with your your car and your bag and go racing obviously when you go nationals there's a lot more sort of 
setting up, if you like. So um, they both have their pros and cons. Um, so a winter race is generally a one day. So maybe there's a little less travel, with the exception of the Tosco Nationals. Um, most touring car races in the UK are just sort of Sundays. So there's maybe less staying away, which is which can be nice. Um, but yeah, I do enjoy the the summer season, and you know the nationals are really good with the we have the the practice on Saturday, and then Saturday night you sort of stay at the track, especially if it's a nice nice weather, and you work on your stuff till it either you get kicked out the track or it gets dark. Um, and also, winning a national championship is always has a higher value than you know the this, this stuff we do in the winter, which isn't any disrespect to the championships in the winter because you're racing the same people but you know it's like a it's the you're the you're the best in the uk if you win that championship um so that's probably yeah for that reason i would probably prefer the outdoors but i enjoy both yeah how about um 12th versus touring car touring car every time yeah. <laughs> ollie 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 we're doing so well i know is that it now? end of the chat That's, yeah i think we should shut this down then <laughs> um, i enjoy it for different reasons i mean twelve scale's always been something i do or i used to try and do both in the winter um but when i used to do or back however many years ago there wasn't that many touring car championships over the the winter um before we had like ews and places like that there wasn't a great deal of places to go where you could race at like a national level um even as races aren't classed as nationals you're still racing the same people so tosca was always something for that reason i basically went along and did it but um oh my watch is talking sorry um (laughs) but i do enjoy driving current mod tosca because they're you know they're fast and even if I was at a track on my own and there was good grip, I would be quite happy to just, you know, drive around all day with a modified twelve scale because it probably is the fastest thing you can drive currently. Um, yeah. So yeah, I've, I am a touring car driver who does twelve scale. That's how I sort of see myself. Yeah. Okay. How about any other classes? Nitro or? Buckies? I've never raced any. I think when I started, I had a, I might have had a two-wheel drive buggy or something that we did a couple of race meetings, but in the sort of, you know, when you have your first couple of years racing, you you try and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Um, I've never been, I, with having a full-time job, it, to be able to do multiple classes, I think, and do them well is, is basically impossible. I think unless you're doing it full-time, 100%. And then you can switch between classes. Um, I'd always rather be good at one than average at a handful. Um, which even changing between Twaskel and Touring Car, I would struggle to do both like 100% through the winter. Um, just because when you're testing one or racing one, you should really be practicing with the other somewhere. So you're never really practicing, you're always just going from race to race. Um, but yeah, I've never really been interested in doing any other classes. Um, I, I wouldn't mind having a go. With, I think I've driven like an eight scale car at Halifax. But again, just somebody give me the handset and I've had like a, a run with it. But yeah, never had the urge to go race anything else. So um, I'm, I'm interested in, and I know Ant is, and I'm sure most of the people out there, the, the, the opportunity to, to get better and, and improve. What, what do you see as your weaknesses as a driver? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I think against people who, if like if you take my time when I was in the same team as Alex, mm. um, if it's your job versus somebody who is not their job, you're always going to have an advantage, even if somebody has less ability. If they can do it all the time, um, you know they can make up for weaknesses or areas they lack in because of that um so if you if you take me and elliot who are the sort of top two touring car drivers i think we do remarkably well against those people given you're always effectively at a disadvantage um Mm. so that's probably 
if I could change one thing, would just be able to drive more or just have that time to just, okay, ETS race coming up, let's do four days at whichever track we go to. Um, so, yeah, that's probably in terms of that, that kind of level of race is a is a disadvantage, which I don't think you can, I'll say, make up for, but it's you can't beat just driving around a track. You know, if you can do it every day, you're going to get better at it if somebody yeah. does it at the weekend. So yeah. I do try and work on other stuff, like if I can sort of stay fit and healthy and all that kind of stuff. Um, maybe you can gain a little bit back somewhere else. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's probably a weakness, which is something is, is hard to, say, work around. But I still managed to race. Um, I've got quite a understanding wife who lets me race basically <laughs> if i need to go practice somewhere i yeah i can go practice um whether that's in the evening after work um or weekends so i'll always try and do as much as i basically physically can um yeah within my seven days of the week wherever i can fit it in um which in the winter is actually quite good because you've got a lot of clubs running on say tuesday nights friday nights so you could race four times in a week if you wanted to um which yeah, I've I've done that if if I feel the need I need to test something or sort something out before the weekend. And and so uh, over the years, as yeah, you know, you've been to all of these national championships. Is there a as a particular mindset that you take to the to the event in terms of sort of mentally how you map it out, uh, getting used to the track, how you've prepped the car, what emotions you might go through if you've had a bad start is there a a sort of go-to's for all of the different eventualities that 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 come your way you feel like you've got enough experience in the tank to problem solve as as they happen um yeah i mean the one thing you have with the national the outdoor season is um like through the winter racing you don't ever look at the weather forecast but when you race outdoors there's something you spend a lot of time (laughs) Okay, let's say we got a national this weekend. You would spend a lot of the, you know, through the week, or oh, check the weather, see what it's going to be. Um, so there's the preparation is different for every race, even though essentially you're trying to prepare in the same way. It, or basically winter to outdoor. Um, I'm quite sort of um, routine in a way. Like I, I would know if I turned up for a race meeting if I wasn't prepared because I basically try and do everything the same every time um, which it sounds simple but for me it, it will highlight something if I'm if I get to Thursday um, you know like for a, a 12 scale national I would never turn up and have to do anything you know I see some people turn up and rushing around trying to true tires and stuff but I'd, I'd at least have enough tires true either to do all of Saturday or at least get me going on Saturday if I thought maybe the tyre size might be different to what I'm going to cut them to. Um, but yeah, I'd hate to turn up sort of... My my biggest fear would be turning up and thinking, oh, I've not done that or I've not done this. Mm. So even if it means you know staying up till it's finished, I prefer to do that and turn up and just need to charge a battery and put some additive on my tyres. Um you know, I, you know, if I see people turn up cutting out body shells and things like that, that would that would probably freak me out a bit. <laughs> but I get people, you know, some people have less time, so they they do turn up at a race, and that's their prep time. So I'm fortunate that I can, you know, if I need to go on my garage an hour earlier or stay in there an hour later, it's, it just needs to be done. So then Alice, my wife, sort of, she understands that's so just never a why are you in the garage for an extra hour? It's just, well, you got stuff to do kind of thing. <laughs> so, yeah, that's pretty much how I, yeah, for me, just turning up with everything sort of ready is my way of going racing, really. And and you write everything down for every race meeting? Um, so I'll always write a setup sheet down. Um, so one thing I do with Toss Girl is I tend to, um, especially like with the world's, preparing for that was every time I raced I'd write sort of in my notepad like so qualifying round one things like how long I did my additive for um and how I thought the car felt and then every time 
I changed stuff, just making notes, almost what you felt the tire prep did when you changed it. Because you can't, if you take like 12 scale, for example, practicing for the worlds, you're not really practicing for the worlds because you can't run on the same track. We couldn't run on the carpet. So if you said to somebody who didn't race, or what are you testing for? You know, well, don't you don't really know because mm-hmm. you could have got there and there could have been zero grip or absolutely insane grip. So you're just trying to basically, or for me, just cover as many different sort of theories and ideas, write them all down, and then you know, if you get to the the world's track, for example, and there was no grip. You can maybe look back to a, a club race you did somewhere where it was really low grip and thought, oh, I actually improved my car by doing that with my tyre additive or car setup. So you've just got sort of something to reference to, but you can never, I don't believe you can go test somewhere and then, right, that's my car ready to go kind of thing. I'm so glad you, you said that. Ollie. writing stuff down. I like you, Ollie. Good. Yeah, I like you. <laughs> but no, because I think, you know, this whole. I, I, it never makes any sense to me this whole testing i'm going testing and uh I, I i mean i just think there's so many alternatives there's so many ingredients that make up the car the track the atmosphere all, all, all of it it just is is such an anomaly <laughs> you know you don't know what's going to come your way but having a portfolio of of options i think is is really what uh you're trying to accrue over, over a, a lifetime's worth of racing, I suppose. And and all of the time, these cars keep on changing, all these different models. I think that it just makes the job harder, doesn't it? Because you know, you've, you've got a different platform that's going to respond and react differently. So uh, uh, the the job is, is so deep in what you've got to be equipped with, ready for the, the race meeting. I think it's uh, it's a very difficult thing to prepare for. Yeah, I mean, if you compare it to, like, Formula One, you've got a guy who looks after, or guys who look after the tyres, you've got a bunch of guys who look after the engine, a bunch of guys who look after the car setup, where we've, okay, you don't have the quite the, the depth that F1 does, but you've got so many things you can change that, I, or for me, anyway, I could never remember it all. And going back to the weakness thing, probably, I write a lot of stuff down, but I still feel like, I haven't written enough mm. stuff down, if that makes sense. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, I'll always sort of, after a race, write a setup sheet out. Um, even if your car's not good, it's good to write the stuff down because at least you know, oh, okay, I won't try that next time. So you haven't wasted a run trying something you tried three weeks ago just because you've forgotten that you've already tried it. Um, also making notes of, like, when you do... Um, races where there's like controlled additives if you take like the world's 12 scale you can actually see what how people are preparing their tires to you know to a degree mm. um so even making notes of what other people are doing is yeah you know, again you can't like remember it. it or um so yeah you you know this thing you can't buy experience but i don't think you can ever really have enough of it mm. and yeah you can only remember so much Ollie, listen, I, I, I think Ant and I could talk to you all night, but very conscious we've taken enough of your time and, and, and hopefully there's a there's a point where you might like to come back on the show and, and talk about more successes that are clearly on the horizon for you. Um, this is your, so a big thanks to you and, and this is your opportunity to thank your sponsors uh, and anyone else you'd like to mention. Yeah, I mean, obviously... I've been fortunate. I've been supported for quite a few years by various sponsors. So without those people, I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't race at the level level I could. So, you know, all the ones that are currently on my car and even the ones from many years ago, if you like, um, yeah, they've, everybody has a, a part in it, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's probably the, yeah, you can always go racing, but to race at a high level, you do need the support from from teams and sponsors. Well said. Well, Ali, we wish you uh, all the luck, uh, you know, in the outdoor season and and future endeavours, and we thank you very much for your time. Well, that wraps up the second episode. Hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, tell your friends, and uh, hopefully we'll see you on the next one.
Thanks for everything. Oh, that was a wanky thing to say. What did I say that for? <laughs> <laughs>